Hello there. Happy New Year. Live from Clearwater, Florida, depending upon your definition of live. This is Alan Gassman, and I am really looking forward to this 60 minute talk on how to make your office or business more effective and enjoyable. This is the first 11 a.m. Saturday session that we've had on anything other than estate planning, creditor protection, and tax planning. We'll be returning to all of that and we'll try to hit every single Saturday for the rest of your natural life and maybe even beyond that. So this presentation does not qualify for continuing education credit, just simply because it's really a pain to get it registered. If anyone in the audience would like to get it registered, please do, and we will thank you profusely. Secondly, how do you ask a question? And I hope you have a lot of questions and suggestions that I can cover at the end or towards the end of the presentation. If you go to the uh, rectangle there and you click on the arrow, the questions arrow there, you'll be able to type in your question. And we've already got a couple of questions. Andy, Happy New Year back to you. Hello, Clay. And hello, Joni. Welcome. All right. Secondly, a lot of what I talk about today, you can find on our YouTube uh, library or other YouTube libraries that I'll talk to you about. We're only gonna scratch the surface on a lot of strategies here. You can do a lot of follow-up uh, with respect to this. Now, I see next Saturday, we're gonna talk about some of my favorite estate plans. And then on the 22nd, we'll talk about estate planning for the business owner. And on the 29th, I'll be joined by Professor Jerry Hash, and I'll mostly listen to Jerry talk about the mathematics of estate planning. He is absolutely brilliant and passionate about that. For those of you who are professionals in the financial arena, please consider the All Children's Estate Tax Legal and Financial Planning Seminar. We started it 23 years ago, and every year it gets a little bit better. It's a real bargain for seven hours of right up to date, cutting edge uh, talks. And if you happen to be in Tallahassee, this is a May 19th live presentation at the College of Business for the annual FICPA FSU Spring Accounting Conference. I'll be talking on a couple of topics that uh, will hopefully be of interest. Now, getting to the reason you all came here, how to make your profession or business more effective, and how to enjoy it. The materials are mostly from a six to seven hour workshop that I give in law schools from time to time on what it's like in the real world and how to do well in the real world. And most of the people who attend these talks at the law schools actually turn out to be lawyers with 20 or more years of experience. And a lot of them are just hitting their foreheads and saying, God, why come, how come no one told me that before I went to high school? That's a good one. So uh, we can send you the whole deck if it's not in your materials. I'm at 452 pages and growing, and I'm sure I'll have suggestions today from the audience uh, on what to do. So, before I get started, let me just say that if you want to have a better enjoyment of what you do and you want to be more efficient, you have to start off by deciding that that's what you want to do and spending a little bit of time and a little bit of effort to do just that. The happiness part comes from a mindset that you have decided to be happy and a skill set and a task set that makes you happy and doesn't make you unhappy. And the efficiency and the effectiveness comes from smart thinking and making changes. Now, a lot of people on this webinar are tax lawyers and CPAs and you don't like to change things. We do personality tests on everybody we hire. We've done three to 400 personality tests in the last 30 years, if not more. And one thing I know is that most great tax lawyers don't like to change anything. 
And most very successful entrepreneurs like to change things every three and a half minutes. So if you're one of those people who don't like to change things, that's fine. Just change a little at a time. If you're one of those people who likes to change everything in five minutes, let's make sure we get into some of the right habits. But if you don't have the intention of, hey, I'm gonna enjoy what I do more, and I'm gonna make my organization more efficient by getting out of its way, then that is a great, great step forward. The other thing I wanna say is that everything I share with you here has two elements. Number one, I didn't make it up. It came from ancient wisdom, or wisdom of the 1950s or 60s or 70s. Nothing I'm talking about here was developed after the 1970s. It's all or most of it is in Benjamin Franklin's autobiography or in a series of books that a man named Napoleon Hill wrote in the 19, early 1930s on how successful people got to be successful. So, you don't have to read any brand new books that you get at the airport bookstore unless you want to. I think it's more important to engage in the classics. The other thing that I've done for the past at least 20 or 25 years is I've always been involved with an organization that provides business coaching. And I've always gone to meetings out of town, put my law practice on the shelf, and thought about my law business and my life for a full day or more on average every 90 days so when i come back i have a better perspective of what i'm doing so you'll have the opportunity during this presentation to spend at least a few minutes doing that and i think you'll find that the gains will be significant now i have tried everything i'm going to talk about here not everything works but many things are more than worth a try. So uh, one very, very important principle here came about from Professor Peter Drucker. He wrote 37 books on business. He was a PhD professor of business, probably the most brilliant one who has ever lived, certainly the most influential one. My favorite quote from Peter Drucker is, you have to quit something before you can do something else. And this was in the 1960s that he said this. Life was overwhelming them then, and they didn't have cell phones interrupting them every five minutes. So think about what you're going to quit so that you have time to add some really nice things. And then secondly, from my present coach and one of my most important mentor is David Finkel from Maui Mastermind. When he, David looks at a business, he's looking for the best 5%. Because the best 5%, if expanded by 10, may be 10 times more profitable and 10 times more enjoyable than the business that's going on now. So please give thought what do you do best that really makes time go to zero and how can you do that all day long and let other people do the other stuff and what works best in your business or your practice and and how can you do more of that and less of the other stuff so uh now i would like you to pull out a, a piece of paper or set up a screen. I personally believe that the human brain works much better by actually writing things down. It, it burns into memory and it causes your subconscious mind to start thinking. But this morning I wrote down three things that I would like to get out of this workshop. And the first thing I wrote down was I would like to see more revenues spent that come in with less time spent. And the second thing I wrote down was that I would like to continue to improve my work experience. 
Now, I'm one of those people who say, thank God it's Monday. I'm so glad to be back here. I'm so excited about what I'm doing. But it could, I could be even more excited on Monday. And then number three, how do I spend more time away from my job, doing things I like to do, and being with people I like to be with? So in order to have this conversation with your subconscious mind, the next step is, why is it important? What's going to motivate me to achieve this item? And with respect to more revenues and less time, I'd like to be under less pressure to pay all of our overhead. And I'd like to be better able to afford to get great staff because my staff costs keep going up and bless them, they're more than worth it. But I'm under financial pressure, everybody is right now, to get a great staff. What's some solutions? Well, I could raise prices. I'm sure all the clients out there enjoy hearing that one. Or I could raise prices for organized packages. If I could better organize my office to offer a particular set of services, which right now we do separately out of, out, out, uh, a la carte and not as efficiently, then I could actually give my clients a better product because of the automation and a better experience for the same or less money, but it can be more profitable for me. That might involve the way that we maintain corporations, the way that we uh, remind people of what they need to get done, or a complete new skill set like really doing a lot of spousal limited access trusts. So my second item, why would I want a more enjoyable work experience? Number one, I'd like to have a better quality of life. And I, when I'm having fun at the office, and yes, I mean fun, laughing, singing, talking, helping people. Secondly, it will give me a better mental and physical health. I know that. And third, I'll get better work product. So I need to think about what are these frustrations that are causing me angst and how do I eliminate them? And how do I delegate things so that I can not have to do what's frustrating? If you give me a lot of information, a lot of complicated information, and I try to handle it myself because of my slightly ADD personality, it could take me two to three hours to pull it together. But my partner, Ken Crotty, could pull it together in an hour and 15 minutes at a lower hourly rate and then explain it to me in 20 minutes and the client is better off and I've had a better time. So we're always looking for what we can delegate and we're gonna talk about how to find people to delegate Two. Third, the more time away from the job. Marcia claims that she would like to see me at home more. I don't always believe that, but it's probably true. And when I'm away from the office for a couple of days, not doing any work, I have a great time and I come back with fantastic ideas. So let me give you one minute here because the conversation that you have with me is less, less important than the conversation you have with yourself. And I'm gonna turn off my camera for one minute, and I'd like you just to start writing down, and later you can print out this page. I'll be glad to send you the page separate. Just start writing down one or two or three items, why they're important to you, and what your next steps are. And it's 11.13 and 42 seconds. I'll see you at 11.14 and 45 seconds.
Okay, so I hope you've gotten a really good start here. And I want to thank Andy Mangus. He's got some good quotes here. He says, if professionals don't like change, they're in the wrong business. Law changes almost daily. To say yes to something, you have to say no to something else. So let's think about those five or six functions you do now and how we can stop doing them or delegate them. And then finally, from Groucho Marx, one of my favorite philosophers, if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong. So now, if you've ever read the Gallup poll book on making your firm a great workplace, it's very interesting. The Gallup poll people do some really neat surveys. And here's what they found employees find to be most important. It's not how much you pay them. If you pay them fairly, what they want is number one, they want all the tools needed to do their job right. Now, I have four staplers, two rolls of tape, and two computers at my desk. If one computer breaks, I just go to the other one. I don't, I tell my assistant, hey, computer broke, I went to the other one, you fix this one while I'm handling the other one. Two staples, because staplers jam up. Stapler jams up, I hand her the jammed one, I'm working with the right one. So number one, the training and the tools. I walk through law firms that only have one computer screen for each legal assistant. I go crazy. Our average legal assistant has three screens. I'm talking to you here from seven screens. Okay, item two, are you doing what you do best. And there's a, a great business coach named Dan Sullivan. He says over and over again, Frank Sinatra did not move pianos. He practiced singing and he sang. So finding out what you do best, what Dan Sullivan refers to as your unique, unique ability. If you read one of Dan Sullivan's books on unique ability and under the Dan strategic coach system, every 90 days, you would make a list of what you're doing and what you'd like to stop doing and what you'd like to start doing and just change a couple of things every calendar quarter to get yourself to where you're doing what you like to do and someone else or no one is doing what you don't like to do. And this is not only for me, this is for everyone in my office. Item three, I want praise and recognition. A lot of us are willing to admit that we want a lot of recognition. How do I get recognition? I'm nice to clients and clients are nice back to me. I send out the Thursday report and when I talk to people, they say, I love the Thursday report. I read it every Thursday, which really tickles me because it only comes out every other week at best. But if they want to tell me they read it every Thursday, that's fine. We like praise. Praise yourself. One of the most important videos I'm going to recommend is by Srikumar Rao. It's his TED video, and it's about listening to your mental chatter. And if your mental chatter is praising yourself, hooray, I did that. I'm great. Versus, oh, I'm so stupid. I only built 12 hours. I should have made it 12.5 hours. How are you praising yourself and how are you going to deal with that? And are you praising others? Because you should always be saying please and thank you and you're so great and you do such a great job and I really, really appreciate you. And that's just what you should be doing with Siri on your phone, with your employees. They need praise, give it to them. Give yourself praise. Work with people who praise you. Item four. My supervisor or boss cares about me. Do you care about your employees and do they care about you? That makes a big difference in an organization. Number five, who is encouraging development? In our firm, we are always encouraging people to get to the next level. You could start off as a receptionist or as a coffee room person and become a high ranking legal assistant in just three or four years. And that has occurred here on many occasions. So 
The per people like to be developed. They like to get better. They like to learn new things. Number six, their opinion counts. And number seven, there's a link between the member and the company's mission or purpose. So it's very enjoyable if you have employees to give them these things. It's important to give them these things. And it's important to give yourself these things. Number eight, doing quality work. Only work on one thing at a time and get it done while you remember what you were doing. Hire a proofreader to proofread it before it goes out. Almost everything that goes out of our office is proofread by Chris Tomlinson, the proofreader. What does Chris Tomlinson do for a living? She proofreads. So everything that we do, we like to have a a, an extra quality step and that really pays for itself. And then number nine, and this was really an interesting one, and the, the, the Gallup poll people were surprised. It's really important to have a friend at the office. And most people at the office, and I've noticed this, we've got about 27, 28 people, they have a best friend at the office. So when somebody comes to work for us, we make sure that two or three different people take them out to lunch with three or four people so that they can go ahead and start those uh, friendships. So hopefully you've seen something that will help you here and i want you to now give a little bit of thought what i've been saying to where is that strongest five percent of your business or your profession that just nice mar uh, morsel of pure gold that when it happens you are in alignment your client or customer is in real alignment. It is profitable for you. It is valuable for them. And how do you expand that? How do you expand that? Now you're gonna say, what do I do with the other 95%? It's necessary. You know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but certainly when you know what your best 5% is, Make sure that you can expand it to six or seven or eight percent at first and take away anything that is getting in its way. On the other hand, what is getting in your way the most? Oftentimes, it's a wrong employee on your team. And there's a rule of thumb about the employees on your team, and that is, would I hire this person today if I knew what I knew now? Would I hire this person today if I knew what I knew now? And if the answer is no, but he's here and he barely gets the job done, but someone else I would have to train, and a couple of the uh, customers or clients do know him, but the error rate is really not what I'd like it to be, the best advice is to try to do without that person and move them to something else or move them out. The same applies to who are your worst clients and your worst customers by category and by individual. And how do you politely move them on to another organization that might better service them? or what are your bad habits? And in the law, I believe a bad habit in the law is spending time doing things at the office that you really don't enjoy tremendously, but you just do them instead of doing your work. You talk on the phone about your personal life a lot until your client starts yawning. You like to answer emails that are unimportant because it's easier to answer emails than it is to do the really core work at hand. You're constantly interrupted and letting yourself be interrupted. So uh, we want to change that. Now spot your strongest and your weakest area here. You've got a personal life. It will interfere with or assist your business and professional life. 
Then there is you as the business owner or the executive or the professional and how you do your things yourself. And then you've got your clients and your customers and marketing or interaction to receive and maintain those clients and customers. And then you have your team, if you're not alone, you've got your team getting the right people on the bus, as they say, getting the wrong people off the bus, as they say. Do you enjoy the people you work with? Who's the most enjoyable person in, the, in your office to work with and how can you work with them more? Most enjoyable and most negative person in your office? And maybe they should work from home or preferably they should work for someone else. We have a candid conversation in our office about positivity versus negativity. A great book is called The No Complaining Rule. I'll commonly give this to uh, employees. It's a very easy read. It's got big print and it's the story of a business that was having a crisis and a lot of negativity and how they turn the negativity to uh, positivity. And you'll see reviews by uh, well-respected uh, athletic coaches. So if you find yourself complaining a lot to yourself or to others, see if you can convert that to suggestions for improvement. Like, oh my gosh, my computer is always breaking. I hate my computer versus Oh my gosh, I really like my IT person. I think I'll spend some more time with her and get her to fix my computer and give me a second computer so I don't have to do this anymore. Just suggestions. Think about what you're complaining about and think about how negative, how negativity spreads. It spreads probably worse than COVID. So positivity on the other hand, works wonderfully. So another great book written in the 1930s by Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. One of his chapters in this book is never criticize, condemn, or complain about anything. And that will work. That will work. What else does he say in the book? He says, smile. When you meet somebody, smile. What else does he say? Use their name. A person's most favorite word is their name. What else does he say? Compliment them. Hi, John, it's great to see you. You had a great year, I see. Whoa, I saw, the, I saw your net worth statement. You're way up, fantastic. I'm so glad your children are doing well in college. Compliment people, commend them. Help them on their journey. That gives you something that the Gallup poll people call the helper's high. I get high. I get dopamine hits from helping people. So when you get that interrupted phone call from your client who didn't plan ahead and has a terrible issue, say, fine, I'll take the call. I'm going to get the helper's high and help this person out. So one way to be happy, by the way, is to act happy. If you smile, you release dopamine hits. It's part of the human body. When you take a deep breath, you activate the vagus nerve. And also, that has a relaxing impact. Just a deep breath can have a relaxing impact. So learn about what helps you in that area. Finally, besides the team and how you interact with the team, is the structures and processes and knowledge base of your business or profession. We have all sorts of forms, protocols, ma user manuals, hundreds of pages of that in our little law firm so that we do things in a uniform way and in an efficient way. We have all sorts of of uh, checklists, all sorts of automated functions, so that if I had to re replace my entire staff of 25 people 
I would say that within a year, I could have 25 equally qualified people doing what we do now because we have the structures, we have the cookbooks. If my office does four of anything in a year, we have a cookbook for how to do that so that it's much faster and much more efficient than it was the first, second, third, or fourth time around. So, you know, when something goes wrong in your office or your business, how were you at fault? It's not necessarily the employee's fault that you didn't have guardrails for them or expect that they were not going to get it right if they didn't have enough training or enough tools. Or it was you who should have fired that employee when you got the first, second, and third red flags. So take some responsibility. Don't automatically blame others. Decide how you're going to take that lemon and make it into lemonade by improving your uh, approach to things. Now, something else very important is as opposed to concentrating on bad stuff that happened or the fear of bad stuff, which will weigh all of us down, we want to be living in the future for the future for the great things we can achieve. Now, for many of us, if you look at where you are right now in life and where you were when you graduated high school, you walked across the stage, you got a diploma, you smiled, and you thought, where am I going? And now look at where you are now. You're probably way ahead of where you thought you were going to be, and that can be celebrated. But you're probably also fearful that you'll come back down. And the best place to be is actively working, doing things that you like to do to get to a next level. So the studies all show that people are happier and that they are much higher achievers, much higher earners, much better innovators if they have written, periodically reviewed goals. So what I maintain and what we encourage are 90-day professional goals, 90-day personal goals, three-year professional goals, three-year personal goals, 10-year professional and personal goals, and lifetime personal and professional goals. And as you meet these goals or change these goals, that's okay. But the first step is to write down the goals. The second step, which will put you way ahead of the game and way ahead of all the other people, is write down what the obstacles are. Well, I want to build 10 hours a day, but I'm constantly interrupted by projects that are not billable. I want to get home at five o'clock on Friday, but something always comes up on Friday that prevents me from getting there. So those are the obstacles. Well, what are the solutions? Well, one solution is I won't have anything on my calendar for Friday after 11 a.m. so that I can be both reactive to the last minute stuff and have plenty of what we call quiet time or Dan Sullivan calls buffer time whatever you want to call it, uninterrupted time to actually get my work done so I can leave by Friday at five. So what I'd like you to do now, and again, this is probably the most valuable time you're going to spend, is go ahead and just do a sprint. Don't think ahead. Let your subconscious mind tell your conscious mind Here's some 90-day, three-year, 10-year, and lifetime goals, and I'm going to turn off the camera. It's 11.34 and 25 seconds. I'm coming back at 11.35 and 25 seconds, also known to many of you as a tenth of a billable hour.
Don't check your emails, turn your watch off. Please write down these goals. Okay, to write down an obstacle and a solution, because the solutions are the most important things, but give us 45 seconds here and sprint out some goals. Okay, now one of the reasons that I have you start these things without giving you enough time to finish them is that I want to make efficient use of this webinar time, but you realize we'll be sending you a recording of this webinar. You can also listen to it like it's a podcast off of the YouTube uh, channel pump that we'll put up, but I hope you'll spend an hour or two this weekend, or as soon as you can, in solitude, alone, maybe with a glass of wine, writing these things down and seeing what it will do for you. I do an annual talk for uh, first year vascular surgeons every year, and I give them three minutes to write down their goals. And at the end of that 90 minute talk, they come up to me and they go, you know, I want to thank you. I have never in my life written down my goals, ever. So I can just see how powerful that would be if I did it every 90 days. Now, if you want it to be even more powerful, share, the, and by the way, here's some example goals that you can look at when you go down uh, to do this. If you want to make your achievement of the goals more likely, you need a, an accountability coach, which could be a friend. You know, if you have a friend who's also watching this webinar who has, or who you have recommended this webinar to, then you might get together every 60 days, have a five minute call and tell everybody, tell him how you're doing, he tells you how he's doing. And that will make the success rate much much higher. So I hope you put that to good use. Another food for thought here is the Pareto principle, also known as the 80-20 rule. Now he invented this in, in Italy in 1896, just before he invented the internet. And what he found mathematically in our world of reality is that 20% of any cause is 80% of any result. So here's some examples of the Pareto principle on the right-hand side there. For most professionals and, and businesses, 80% of revenue comes from 20% of orders. 80% of revenue comes from 20% of clients. 80% of revenue comes from 20% of salespeople. Conversely, 80% of the mistakes in my office are made by 20% of the people. And I know who they are. So I know what kind of work to give them or to not give them and what guardrails need to be established. 80% of problems with clients are going to be from 20% of clients who have certain characteristics. They may not be intellectually honest. They may not like to pay their bills. They may be very scattered and prone to blame others for their own scatteredness. I know that 80% of my 
problems with clients will come from 20% of the clients. If I could eliminate that 20% of the clients, that 20% of the employees, then I will ramp up my entire practice. By the same token, I can produce 80% of a client's project in 20% of the time. So I could meet with a client and say, you know, this is a four week project, but in the next five days, I'm gonna get you 80% of what you need. It's gonna be a rough draft. You could wait the four weeks before you look at it. I'm gonna solve your most important problem tomorrow using the 80-20 rule. Here's another example of the 80-20 rule that I am sometimes guilty of, and I know a lot of lawyers are. I receive three projects in a day, and they're notebooks full of papers, letters, emails, and I do project one, it takes me five days, then I do project two, takes me five, Project three doesn't even get started until week three. Why wouldn't I spend two hours on project one and get the client the initial response, tell them what I need from them, and maybe even solve a couple of the problems, get the draft out using the 80-20 rule. Same day I go to project two and I do the same thing. I assign it to my team members. It comes back to me almost done. And then project three, I look at the same day, I realize it's not for our law firm. It's just not a fit for us, or it's going to cost a lot. The client's not mentally prepared to pay that. It's going to take a lot of time. Hey, Floyd, thanks for giving me project three. I don't think we're the right fit, or we need to talk about this. So look at those piles on your desk, and especially the things you've procrastinated, the procrastination things. Just give it that first half hour. Just give it the first half hour and hand it off to somebody else, but use this Pareto principle when, whenever you can. Now, besides a Strategic Coach, which if you join Strategic Coach, you'll go every 90 days to a really good eight hour workshop with other professionals and business owners in your income bracket with a great coach. That, that's one program. Another program, Maui Mastermind. Similar to Strategic Coach, except that the quarterly conferences are more like two to three days and you are assigned an actual coach who is an experienced business person who will keep you very accountable if you will let them. The third program that I've really enjoyed and taken periodically is Srikumar Rao's Personal Mastery course. He calls it Creativity and Personal Mastery. And one thing that I did in his course was I designed my whole day. Because if you consider your life to be a really neat thing or even a cathedral, every part of the day can, can be improved. And those part of the days that aren't working so well, you can decide uh, what to do with. So I'm gonna share my typical day with you and see if you might get some ideas. And by the way, there's no way we're gonna finish this presentation in 60 minutes, but so if you want me to do a part two sometime, I will. My personal day, admittedly, I'm a workaholic, so I work a lot. I wake up at five and I put Layla the dog on the bed. I don't wake up Marsha or I'll be in big trouble. By 5.20, I sit down every day and I rewrite my to-do list. And there it is, handwritten, right there. I hand wrote it this morning. Sun Saturdays, I sleep in till 6.15 or so. And I wrote down my to-do list. And then these initials are people who are gonna do help me with these things. So on Monday, I'm gonna track them down and ask them how we're doing. And then I keep my time on contem contemporaneous handwritten time slips back from the 1800s. And I know exactly how much time I've spent and no time slips through. 
If I do something that is not billable to a client, I still keep track of it. By noon, I have six hours. And if I don't, then I miss something and I've got to go back and see what it was. At the end of the week, I know how much time I spent helping to organize the All Children's Conference. I know how much time I spent helping my sister-in-law with an issue I'm not gonna bill her for. But at least I know how much time it is. And when I was beginning practice, I resolved to always get six billable hours in before I did anything else. So if it was an interruption from a relative, it was a, a video I wanted to watch to learn something new, it was developing our forms. I never touched any of that until I had my six billable hours in. Later in life, that got to 10. So I really don't touch anything that's not billable until I've got my 10 hours in. And that's just the way I like to do things. So 5.30, I leave my house. I've got my list of what to dictate. I keep a list of what to dictate and I dictate it on the way in. 5.50, I go to the printer here that has what the overnight typists and law clerks have printed. We maintain Stetson Law students who work at night. So when I go home, I dictate on the way home and I put the uh, dictaphone onto the my computer at home and my computer at home automatically transmits that transcription recording to a Stetson Law student who works on our system remotely. Typically they work from 10 until 2 a.m. That's by their choice. We pay them a lot by the hour. And then they do what I've asked them to do to the best of their ability and they print it on our remote printer. So I get in at 5.50. And I have what they've done, and it's already stapled and collated, three hole punched, whatever I wanted. I give my morning dictation to a secretary who is always here by 6 a.m. And then I get on my treadmill. And on my treadmill, I walk four miles an hour. I have a big table on the treadmill, and I do work on the treadmill from 6 a.m. to 7:30 a.m or at least 75 minutes going four miles an hour. My heart rate averages 105 minutes uh, beats per minute, and I can uh, dictate, I can read, and I have a, just my inbox is that treadmill. It is in a separate room from the office I'm sitting in where people don't go and the phone doesn't ring. So during the day when I wanna review something, I don't do it at my desk here where I'm sitting, I do it in my treadmill room, standing in front of that table where I am not interrupted. Because one of the most important things I was gonna to mention today is you need time where your mind knows you will not be interrupted. The fact that you may get 25 minutes uninterrupted, but your mind thinks you may get interrupted means that you're not working as efficiently. When you go on an airplane flight and you put your phone on on airplane mode, do you notice how much longer the battery lasts? The phone is not using a lot of energy checking, 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 checking. I might get interrupted. I might get interrupted. I might get interrupted. We don't want that. We want you to be able to turn off your phones, close your door, whatever it takes. And for people in our office, we have quiet spaces. You can go to a quiet space and people will not interrupt you. And everyone needs that. I mean, I have one partner who goes out to his car and drives around while he dictates, so he will not get interrupted. And I have done that as well. So 7.40, I'm off the treadmill. I've given my treadmill work, and it's all being assigned throughout the office. I keep a spreadsheet of my dictations. So I fill this out or the secretary fills this out and then she circles the, the initials of the person who's going to do the dictation. We know the length of the trend of the dictation. We know the client's name. We know how long I expect it to take by estimate. And later I'm told whether it got done and who did it. And then we have one person here whose main job 
is to send copies of marked up documents to our overnight people and our daytime remote people. Just, we want to get the work done efficiently. I like for it to be done as soon as possible after I dictate it. The next thing I do when I get off that treadmill, at 8 a.m., at 7.40, I talk to a remote uh, secretary we have, and we do my charting. So for every client, I have a chart, and she sets up that chart and updates the chart and updates my to-do list. So I talk to her in the morning, and I, I look at the charts with her on the large screen that I have here. So another thing we do in our firm is whenever we I do something and I want to remember how to do it, I put the document into a red note. Now, please don't tell anyone that I don't actually have a library that I do these webinars on. Now, from 8 to 8.30, I work on what's in my inbox that was done since I got there at 6 by my 6 a.m. secretary. And at 8, I do things on my computer that I can do on my computer. I'm pretty clumsy, but I can copy and paste and answer emails. I'm better off if I tell someone to do it for me and that they do and they do it for me, then it only takes me 30 seconds versus three minutes or four minutes. And if I have to do 10 of those a day, there's a lot of savings. Now, most of the people who work directly with me, which is about eight or nine people, all carry small $80 recorders. And the reason is whenever they talk to me, the recorder is on. So I don't have to wait for them to take notes or to wonder about whether I talk slow enough. They do take notes. We all take notes by hand when we talk to each other. But by the same token, they do record it. So then they have everything I said, and I can talk as uh, fast as I want, and I'm less likely to cuss when, uh, when I'm being recorded. So uh, I'll show you some pictures here. This is my office. And th these five screens are the computer I normally use. This is a touch tone screen. It is about three and a half feet by five feet. So I can use my hands like you do on an iPad and see a client's chart there. And then these are the four normal screens, but these two bottom screens are touch screens. So I can make things bigger or smaller as you see there on these two bottom screens. And then this is my second computer. So while I'm on a video call, or if my computer is malfunctioning, I have access to my second computer. And then there's also a third computer that you can't see here, which is my go to my PC computer that I can call in uh, or link in from home. So this is my assistant's view of my desk. This is a plexiglass barrier and I can wear a mask and my employee can wear a mask and that's what we do, but we sit down together, we're pretty close to each other and we hand things around this. You see my red notebooks there. You see my paper towels, because I spill stuff all the time. And uh, then this is the view of Riley's office. Riley is connected by French doors to me. So this is my view of Riley. This is Riley's view of me. So while I'm talking to a client, I can put the client on mute and say, hey, Riley, bring me the chart. Email me her trust. Who am I talking to? What's her husband's name? So Riley prompts me, reminds me, and keeps me on track. And my phone does not ring. Quite candidly, my phone is on Riley's desk. See that? That's, that's my phone. And then over here is Riley's phone. So when you call me, I cannot answer the phone. Some important people have my cell phone number, but normally Riley picks it up and says, Mr. Gassman's office, can I help you? Oh yes, I need the tax ID number for my LLC. So I was calling Alan, who bills $6.95 an hour to ask him for the tax ID number for my LLC. And then Riley can say, I'll get that for you. Thank you very much. Or the phone may say, hey, this is Alan's very best client. 
and I have a new project for him. Is he here? Riley puts her on mute and says, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, that's good. My very best clients don't mind that I never pick up my phone. They like Riley better than me anyhow. There's my treadmill. Now the treadmill is down there and it's a separate device and then the table's here. Uh, if you want the, the specifics, I'll give them to you. There is a treadmill that goes five miles an hour, but it's not nearly as good as the four mile an hour treadmill. I don't get to my maximum heart rate, but it, it's still, I think, pretty good exercise. And you see there's a mirror there so the staff can come up behind me and talk to me and, and we can make um, eye contact. Now, to the right of my treadmill are these sorting bins. So I can just, if I want to give something to my partner, Chris, I throw it from the treadmill to Chris's uh, bin and I'm a really good thrower. It's kind of like basketball. I usually uh, don't mess that up. So what from those things can you put into your routine? What can you add that would make you more efficient. With limited time, I want to mention that something else I do, which really helps me, is that after a client meeting, I am debriefed by somebody on our staff. Some human being hears from me the story of the client, what we're doing for the client, what my handwritten notes say, and what I want to remember about it. And then my notes are scanned into the client's meeting directory before we can lose them. And that's really important. And a lot of times I mark up the big chart and our chart printer actually has like a paper feeder where a four foot wide piece of paper goes into it and scrolls in and is all, um, all copied so I could reprint my, hand, my uh, chart. So there's a lot of good information here on your daily task list. The best book for your daily task list, list is by Alan Lakin, L-A-I-K-E-N, I believe, How to Get Control of Your Time in Your Life. It was written in the 1970s, and he stole it from Ben Franklin. And then the, the Franklin Covey day planner system stole it from Alan Lakin. But... If you do the day planner system, which works better than my clipboard, you'll write down all your items, you'll rate them, and then you'll do the things that are more important first, and you'll never get around to your Ds. You'll do your A's and a few B's, and you'll never get around to your D's, unless D means delegate, and you uh, give it to someone else. Another exercise I'd like for you to do on your own is your time wasters. What are your three biggest time wasters? And if it's a person, just tell them to stop. Say, hey, you know, I love you, but I love my spouse more. And the nine minutes that you spend every day telling me about your shopping list and your problem with your spouse is nine minutes less of income for me. I'm not doing it anymore. So for me, the biggest time waster is I get involved with what David Finkel calls the shiny objects. That looks neat. Let's get into that. Let's think about it. Let's learn about it. No, do that after you have your 10 hours in. Don't get involved with things that are not efficient. Now, one time waster is attending a boring meeting by video when you could do it by audio and get other work done during the boring meeting. Even if Riley, if it's if it's a committee you're on, Riley could sit in and listen to that meeting and say, Alan, listen to this part. They just said X, Y, Z, while I can get my work done and, and be better at what I'm doing. So I have pages here for you to put down your new habits. It takes usually 21 days to build a habit. Try to work on one habit a month for personal business, one habit for work week. That habit is before I start working, I'm turning off the phone, turning off the watch, going into a separate room, telling my family not to bother me, walking the dog before the dog needs to be walked, whatever that um, may be. A 
fantastic book that I always recommend by Sri Kumar Rao is Happiness at Work. It's made a big impact on me and a big impact on a lot of other people. Another great book that will help you with your client relationships and help clients significantly. Dale Carnegie's book, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. If you ever have the opportunity to take the Dale Carnegie course, there's a nice little video where Warren Buffett says the most important educational thing he ever did was take the Dale Carnegie course. So I thought when I was 45 years old, I still thought, boy, I've read all the books. I wouldn't get anything out of the course. I already know this stuff. I got a lot out of the Dale Carnegie course. So if there is a Dale Carnegie course in your community or within a short travel time, definitely take the course. It covers how to solve problems in a business-like way and how to use that really weird contraption known as the human mind. Now, if you want a deeper dive and you are interested in psychology, then the book Flow was written in the 1970s by Mahali Csikszentmihalyi. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but this book is really, really, there's his name, a very fascinating book and a very practical book at the same time. And you can also check out his uh, YouTube video. The final thing I want to mention is that we, our law firm lives and dies by personality tests, primarily the Omnia profile test, which I've been using, like I said, for about 30 years. Anytime I have hired against their advice, exactly what they said went wrong is going to go wrong. I tend to like everyone I meet, so I don't meet anyone before we hire them as far as the non-lawyer staff. I rely on the tests they took and in particular on the Omnia profile. If you want information on Omnia profile, uh, let me know, but here's some sample reports. And then everyone that I work with has taken a Colby A test. The Colby A test, you can read about Colby on their website. She is a well-respected psychologist and her test only gives you four items. Does the person lead in their mode as a fact finder because they want a lot more information? Do they tend to follow through? Do they want to start new things? Are they good with mechanical and computer uh, uh, devices? So I am a very quick, very high quick start. I'm, I lead in quick start. When I see something, I want to change it and improvement and improve it. My wife leaves, I mean leads, she doesn't leave, I hope. Ooh. My wife leads in fact finder, which means she likes to know all the facts before she does anything. My partners all lead in fact finder. Most good tax lawyers lead in fact finder because they wanna know all the information. So I can drive them absolutely crazy, but I can also keep up the conversation with an entrepreneur who only has a three minute attention span because I only have a four minute attention span. So we know that legal secretaries need to be high in fact finder and high in follow through. We know that every organization needs at least one quick start. If you're not a quick start and you don't have one in your organization, bring one in part time to help you spot your changes and improvements. But the Colby A test only costs $50. You can put a credit card in. It comes with a podcast explaining you to you. And if you find, as many entrepreneurs do, that the look quick fact finder is relatively low, the follow through is relatively low, the quick start is high, you need to find somebody with a medium quick start because if there's more than three points difference in quick start, there will be a personality conflict. It's not a bad person, it's just not a person that you are able to uh, work with. So there's people in our office who I don't interact with because my quick start is a seven, theirs is a two, and we would just drive each other crazy. So we say, hi in the hall, you do a great job, thank you so much, and you won't have to be exposed to me too often.
All right. So that completes my hour in 12, in one hour and five minutes. I apologize that I went over. Let me go ahead and tell you now what some of the uh, comments were. Richard White. I hate to fire people. How do you do that? Well, I'm afraid to fire people. So my office manager, Kim, likes to fire people. And I used to have an office manager, Tina. And Tina hated to fire people. So I started paying her $300 in cash after tax for every person she fired. And the first person she fired, she took the 300 and said, thanks, that hurt. The second person she fired, she took the 300 and said, thanks, I don't like doing that. The third person she fired, she took the 300 and she said, that wasn't bad. And then the fourth person she fired, she said, I like it now, I don't need the 300 anymore. But that, that fire decision is where a lot of organizations end up with mediocre people. And if you uh, read, the uh the book by jim collins what is it called great great something uh, good to great good to great jim collins is a professor and he did a study of many businesses and he found the most important thing about the businesses and the success of the businesses was number one they concentrated on getting the right people on the bus his chapter on getting the right people at the bus is great. In fact, companies like Sony and uh, Hewlett Packard concentrated on getting the right people in their business before they got into their business. Sony made a rice cooker. That was the, the business of Sony to make a rice cooker, but they had the right people. So then when they made the Walkman cassette player with headphones, now they make all kinds of things. Hewlett Packard was a consulting company. They didn't even think about building a printer. What they concentrated on was getting the right people. Secondly, there was a good but not egotistical leader. A good but not egotistical leader. I'm sure I fail that test. And then third, is the organization measures something. I measure revenues. Every Saturday, I go through, I get a report of our revenues, and I go through every single bill, and I see what everybody did on every project, and I send the bills as soon as I can, because I don't want to wait a month like most law firms, because if, if the client gets the bill five weeks after the work, they don't remember the work, they don't appreciate it as much, so we measure revenues and I measure how much, how many hours goes into every project. And I do that every single week. Other lawyer friends of mine measure their expenses. I don't think that's as, that's as good. And there's, there's more things I can say about that. Okay. I consider recognizing and acknowledging my wife's actions to be one of my su su most successful relationship tools. Yes, that is a fantastic observation okay from michael i'm a forensic accountant in red flow in the early 80s and have been uh, a, a gtd user since 1984 i've had colby your discipline is remarkable this is the best hour i've spent for a very long time wow thank you very much michael that was very nice um okay and then michael also says and this is important hire slowly and fire quickly now, what we do is if they pass the Omnia profile, we hire quickly. But if they're leaving another job, we make them work a weekend or evening. And we'll, we'll pay them plenty to work a weekend or evening at an overtime rate while they keep their other job, because I don't want to take them from another job if they're not going to work out in um, our office. So I think that's, that's very important. So I will do another one of these. We'll do maybe a, a noon session after one of the 11 o'clock tax sessions. I want to thank everyone for attending. We started the presentation with about 148 people. There's 138 of you still on here. 
If any of you would like to be introduced to others of you to form a mastermind type of weekly check-in or something like that, I'll be glad to introduce you to one another. Thanks for all you do. Um, really appreciate it. Giving a talk like this is more helpful for me than it probably is for anybody out there. Uh, have a fantastic rest of your weekend, and I hope to see you again next Saturday or many other Saturdays. And thanks to Kelsey. Kelsey works Saturday, and make sure that these webinars happen. Thank you.